Good evening and welcome. My name is Connie Snyder and I'm a first link coordinator in the Saskatoon Resource Centre. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan's Evening of Education, Understanding Dementia. This evening, we hope you learn about the risk factors of some of the different types of dementia, the warning signs and the importance of and how to get a diagnosis. But before we begin, I'd just like to take a couple of minutes to do some housekeeping. We are recording tonight's presentation. However, um, nobody's names or any of the attendees' names will be shown on the recording. So everybody is good in that aspect. And tonight's recording will be available on our YouTube channel in the weeks to come. Along with your Zoom link tonight, uh, you should have received a copy of the presentation. So there's many great resources as well on our website if you wish to go have a peek there. The formal presentation will be about an hour followed by a question period. You can type your questions into the bottom part of your screen where it's marked Q and A, not the chat, but the Q and A on the bottom of your screen. You can put those questions in throughout the evening and we will have a couple of our staff will be moderating those uh, questions and we'll present the questions to Dr. Lajemodier at the end of the presentation. We would ask you though, to keep your questions relevant to tonight's topic being presented. And if you have other questions that aren't addressed or talked about, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of the society staff at one of the seven resource centers across the province or by calling our dementia helpline. So now I would like to introduce Dr. Lajemodier. Dr. Krista Lajemodier received her medical degree from the University of Saskatchewan in 2015, followed by completion of a three-year internal medicine residency in Saskatoon. She completed a two-year subspecialty fellowship in geriatric medicine in Vancouver in June of 2020, and was hired as a geriatrician in the, with the Saskatchewan Health Authority in August 2020. She is dual certified through the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada in internal medicine and geriatric medicine. She is currently building her geriatric medicine practice in Saskatoon and aims to elevate, uh, aims to elevate, elevate the healthcare experience for older adults in Saskatchewan across the entire continuum of care. Her interests fall, include falls and fracture prevention, frailty assessments and intervention, and community outreach for vulnerable older adults. She lives in Saskatoon with her husband and is honored to be practicing in her hometown. And so now I'd like to give you a warm welcome to um, presenting for us tonight. Thank you, Connie, for the introduction. So it's my pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm very um, pleased to be um, discussing and um, starting this conversation with you all this evening about dementia or understanding dementia. So I hope you're all warm and cozy and have a cup of tea or a snack. Um, and we'll just kind of begin. So, so tonight's objectives um, that we will be touching on include a discussion around the risk factors for dementia. We'll also touch on the different types of dementia, warning signs um, to look out for, and the importance of how to get a diagnosis, um, as well as um, the Alzheimer's Society will be at the end of the discussion sharing some of the resources that are very important as well as part of the, the full um, comprehensive treatment plan for those with dementia. So what is dementia? Um, dementia is an umbrella term. It's, it's not a diagnosis per se, but it, it's, a, it's a term that describes um, a a whole host of diseases that can lead to dementia, which essentially describes a, a change in cognition that interferes with one's ability to function in day-to-day -day life. And as you can see here, it's an umbrella term and there are many types of dementia or diseases that cause dementia. The most common one we think of is Alzheimer's disease. And as you can see here, you know, oftentimes Alzheimer's disease is interchangeably used um, with dementia, but it's not synonymous with dementia because we know that various other diseases can cause dementia. So although Alzheimer's disease is 
one of the most common types of dementia. Um, there are other diseases that can lead to dementia. So this is not an exhaustive list and we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail about some of these diseases. Um, but in, ge in general, dementia is in a, an umbrella term or a broad term to describe a number of different diseases. What causes dementia? So the first thing I want to share with you all today is that dementia is not a normal part of aging. When we think about dementia, it's essentially changes in cognition that affect function, as I've mentioned. And no, although it is, um, although the risk of developing dementia increases with age, it is not inevitable that as we get older, we will develop dementia. And many people who are in their 80s, 90s, or even in their hundreds do not have dementia. So although it increases um, in prevalence as we get older, it is not an inevitable um, part of aging. When we look at dementia um, and we look at the brain, the brains of those with dementia, um, this is a, a cross section of the brain. And you can think of a cross section as, as though if you had a brain in front of you and you cut it from left to right, and you're kind of looking at the structures of the brain head on. And if we look on the left side, that's, that's what a normal brain should look like. So you can see there's different curves, we call that those gyri, and there's different parts of the brain that have different functions. So for example, um, in the temporal region of the brain, which kind of overlies on the left side, um, or left and right side here, that's where the language centers are. And um, so if, if, if you have a disease that affects that part of the brain, you may have difficulty with some of the language function. Um, similarly, in sort of the deeper parts of the brain, um, a bit deeper from the language centers, we have the memory centers. So if you have a disease that affects that part of the brain, you may have difficulties with memory. If you look on the right side, that is what a cross-sectional um, image of uh, an Alzheimer's brain looks like. And as you can see, um, you, you might be able to appreciate that there's definitely some uh, reduction in brain volume or the size of the brain. And we also see that the parts of the brain that um, function with respect to memory and language, there's also loss of brain matter there. And so that helps us understand why people with Alzheimer's disease or certain types of dementia present with different cognitive symptoms. It's related to the changes that are occurring in the brain that are affecting um, those areas that are responsible for those day-to-day -day functions. And although we don't diagnose dementia based on um, brain scans, and we certainly don't um, biopsy brains or, or look at brains in living people, um, we can research um, brains of those with Alzheimer's disease after they've passed away to help us understand the disease and, and, and learn more about it. This is a, a cartoon depiction of a brain and um, you know, the brain is a complex organ and this demonstrates again, um, how different parts of the brain function in different ways. And so for example, in the front part of the brain, that's where our, um, executive function lies. So in other words, problem solving, problem solving, um, planning complex tasks like banking, driving, um, as well as personality and our social um, cognition. In other words, our ability to, to understand social cues, you know, that, that lives in the front part of the brain. Um, we already talked a bit about the temporal lobe or the, or this part of the brain that, that controls our language. And then in the deeper parts, memory, and then at the back of the brain, vision. So as you can see, I didn't go through all the parts, but the brain is a very complex structure. And when we think about dementia, we think about what part of the brain is affected by the disease causing dementia. And so depending on the type of dementia, it may affect a certain part of the brain first. So for example, um, there's a condition called frontal temporal lobe dementia, which we will touch on in a bit deeper later on in this talk but it, as you can imagine, affects the frontal and temporal lobes. And so those individuals are gonna present with symptoms that are related to executive functioning, personality changes, 
um, behavioral control or emotional lability issues. Whereas Alzheimer's affects more of the memory parts of the brain. So people with Alzheimer's disease typically present with memory or short-term memory as a cardinal symptom. So it's important to know um, the different parts of the normal functioning brain as it helps us with pattern recognition to determine what type of dementia someone may have. And that's another reason why it's important to diagnose early because it's in the early stages that we can really determine what cognitive areas of the brain are affected. And that helps us with that pattern recognition. There are many causes of dementia, um, which um, this is certainly not an exhaustive list, but an easy way to think about dementia is, you know, it's an umbrella term, it's caused by a number of conditions and diseases. And you can think of it as sort of two categories. There are acute reversible causes of dementia, which tend to be uh, more rare. And then there are chronic irreversible causes of dementia, which are, are more common and is it more typical of what I would see um, in my clinics, for example. So some examples of reversible causes would be infections, um, depression, um, has been shown to mimic dementia. So that's an important thing to note. Certain metabolic causes like thyroid disease, vitamin B12 deficiency, certain cancers may or may not be reversible. But when we're, when we're identifying and assessing someone who may have dementia, we wanna make sure we're ruling out any of these things that could be treatable or reversible. On the right side, these are the types of dementia or the diseases that cause dementia that are progressive, irreversible, and do not have a cure. Um, but that doesn't mean there's no treatments for them. It's just that we don't have a cure. And these diseases tend to be more chronic, slowly progressive. And this is um, um, what we will be focusing on on today's talk. We can also think of types of dementia in these four categories. So as I mentioned, chronic progressive disorders or neurodegenerative diseases, and the classic one would be Alzheimer's disease. So it's a progressive, slowly progressive disease that is irreversible. Vascular dementia is another type of dementia, and there are many types of vascular dementia. Typically it involves a history of having a stroke, um, Subcortical dementia, so subcortical meaning, you know, we have the cortex of the brain, which is the outer layer of the brain, and then subcortical beneath the outer, uh, the outer layer, the deeper parts of the brain. And those types of dementias tend to be, you know, vascular, um, kind of falls under that category, but also Parkinson's disease, um, Huntington's disease, um, HIV related dementia, those are all examples of subcortical dementias. And then head trauma is also um, a, a big category you can think of as a cause for dementia or a type of dementia. The best way to understand dementia is to talk about the most common type and that's Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia. It is the type of dementia we think of when we think about dementia, although as I've mentioned, it is not synonymous with dementia as there are many different diseases that can lead to dementia. But Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common. It is a progressive disease. It results from damage or degeneration to brain cells related to abnormal um, proteins that accumulate in the brain um, like beta amyloid and tau. Um, and essentially it is irreversible meaning the damage that occurs cannot be repaired. And unfortunately, we do not have a cure at the present time, but I can assure you that it's an area of, of hot research. And I think, um, you know, there are many great minds working on um, targeted treatments for Alzheimer's dementia. And, I, and I, I'm hopeful that within my lifetime or within my career, I'm just starting my career. My hope is by the end of my career, at the latest, um, we will see some groundbreaking stuff with Alzheimer's disease. What's important to note though with Alzheimer's dementia is although memory loss is the, the most common presentation that people have with Alzheimer's disease, it, it can affect other things like language, 
um, and executive functioning as well, especially later on in the disease. What's also important to note is any type of dementia must affect a person's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's a requirement for the diagnosis. So Alzheimer's disease, it's not just memory loss, it's um, memory loss and other cognitive deficits that impair one's ability to function on a day-to-day -day basis. There are a number of risk factors that have been identified um, that are associated with developing Alzheimer's dementia. Age is one of them. And although, as I mentioned, age is not, or sorry, dementia is not a part of normal aging, as we get older, our risk of developing dementia does increase. So it is a risk factor similar to all the other risk factors listed head injury being one of them, and in particular, severe head injury that has resulted in loss of consciousness. So I always ask my patients if they've had a history of head injury. Um, high blood pressure or hypertension. It, it, there's growing evidence to support that hypertension, especially in midlife, so in our 40s, 50s, hypertension contributes to dementia risk. And that's why it's so important to treat that in your middle-aged years to prevent um, dementia from developing later on. Other things like high cholesterol, smoking, obesity, diabetes, all the things that lead to heart disease lead to brain disease. And they're all risk factors for Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Stroke um, also can increase one's risk of Alzheimer's. Um, education. so. We, we typically say that an education level of less than grade 12 um, can increase one's risk. So the more education, it, it can be a protective effect. Depression, so untreated depression is a risk factor for dementia. Um, certain genetical, genetic abnormalities, and then APOE4, um, which is a, uh, an allele or a, 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 another genetic um, abnormality that can increase one's risk. But it's important to note that um, it's not inevitable that one will develop Alzheimer's disease, but it is a risk factor if they have one of these um, Apple E4 um, alleles. When we talk about Alzheimer's dementia, it truly is a journey. So it is a disease that can last and, you know, it varies from person to person, but up to 10 years or more. And we, we, we look at the disease in stages and there are various um, staging um, tools that we use. Um, I, I like to use the global deterioration scale. It's a seven stage scale that we use to determine what stage an individual is in, in their illness journey. Um, but um, in simplistic terms, you can think of Alzheimer's dementia or Alzheimer's disease as uh, early, middle, late, and end of life. And so it's important to note that a diagnosis of dementia does not automatically mean end of life. It, it truly is a, a chronic progressive disease that is a journey. And depending on the individual, it may last eight years, it may last 10 years, and each stage may be a few years, several years, a few months. So it really varies depending on the individual. Moving along to vascular dementia. So vascular dementia is a type of dementia that's also quite common. It's different from Alzheimer's disease in that it's not necessarily a neurodegenerative disease. It's a result of vascular disease, or in other words, uh, strokes or, or, or silent strokes. So there are different types of vascular dementia. Um, a common cause is, is a major stroke. So if someone's had a stroke, essentially what happens is, is there's interrupted blood flow to a certain part of the brain. And as we alluded to earlier, um, if you disrupt blood flow to, let's say, the part of the brain that controls language, you may lose some nerve cells and nerve function, and that may affect your language permanently. So a stroke can lead to dementia. Um, it can be large or small, um, or many strokes can be cumulative and additive and contribute to a dementia risk over time. 
Another type of vascular disease isn't related to a stroke, but what we call small vessel disease. So it's, it's quite common and arguably might be the most common type of vascular dementia as we get older. You can think about small vessel disease as the little tiny vessels that enter the deep parts of the brain and things like high blood pressure, diabetes, smoking can damage those small vessels. And over time you can have um, cumulative damage to the deeper parts of the brain that can ultimately affect your cognition and function leading to a dementia diagnosis. Lastly, when we think about vascular dementia, it can present in a wide variety of ways, but one of the ways that we, we think of it is a sort of a, a step-like progression or a stair-like progression. And you can think of it in the sense that if you've had a stroke, you might have a fairly abrupt decline in your cognition and function. But after that acute event has happened, you might stabilize for, for a while. And then you may have another insult or another stroke or another event in the brain that leads to another decline. And you may stabilize for a period of time, but then you may deteriorate again once, once um, more damage accumulates. Other people present similar to Alzheimer's disease in a very progressive downward trajectory. Um, so it really depends on the individual. There are a number of risk factors for dementia, uh, vascular dementia, many of which overlap with Alzheimer's dementia. So age, we know that as we get older, um, our chance of stroke also increases. And as a result, our risk of vascular dementia increases. Again, the same things that affect our heart affect our brain and can lead to vascular dementia. So diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, and heart disease are all risk factors for vascular dementia. And if you've had a history of heart disease or a heart attack or a stroke, you probably are already on a blood thinner, blood pressure pills, and you should continue on that as those are gonna prevent you from having future strokes or future damage to the brain that could lead to dementia. Moving on to frontotemporal dementia. So frontotemporal dementia is, is a condition that I don't see very often. It tends to occur actually in, in younger people. So diagnosis usually in the 50s to 60s um, or even younger, um, but it's, it's a dementia that is quite different from Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia in that it tends to affect the frontal part of the brain. And we sort of talked about it already, but typically, you know, we'll often see early behavioral changes. So some examples would be changes in personality or acting out of character, um, difficulty with planning tasks um, and problem solving judgment. Um, other things that can be impaired are, uh, you know, one may notice changes in emotions or empathy. Um, oftentimes family members will comment that you know, their loved one is acting out of character or more withdrawn or, or more apathetic or doesn't seem to be interested. So those are all signs that could point to a frontotemporal dementia. There's another subtype of frontotemporal dementia that, that um, tends to affect language. Um, and it can be quite profound, um, whereby there's severe difficulties with communicating or using the right words. Um, and, and those are described as primary progressive aphasias. And, and they're more rare, but they are a subtype of uh, a frontotemporal dementia. Frontotemporal dementia is, is an interesting um, condition in that we don't really know what causes it yet. We do know that there are a number of genetic factors that increase one's risk of developing frontotemporal dementia. And the classic example is Pick's disease, which is um, an, an inherited genetic form of frontotemporal dementia. But that accounts for about half of cases. We still have 50% of cases that don't have a family history and may not have a genetic link. So it's still an area of research and uncertainty but we do know that it is one of the types of dementia that does have or can have a genetic link. So it's always important to, to, to ask um, 
patients with suspected frontotemporal dementia, if they have a family history of, of people in their um, ancestry line that may have had um, a dementia diagnosis, changes in behavior, et cetera. Lewy body dementia is another type of dementia that is not uncommon. Um, I see it, you know, periodically. It is a cousin of Parkinson's disease in that the underlying pathology of the disease um, is sort of the same abnormal protein that we see in Parkinson's disease. Essentially, Lewy body dementia is named after the underlying pathology or Lewy bodies, which are essentially um, abnormal structures that form in the brain that include a protein called alpha-synuclein, which sort of, it's not supposed to be in the parts of the brain that it is, and it can lead to um, neurodegeneration or damage of nerve cells. It's, uh, its presentation is quite unique in that it can present very fluctuant in, in, in cognition and alertness. So a, a, a typical family member may describe that their loved one has some good days and bad days and their cognition tends to fluctuate over time, over days to weeks. Um, they can present with very profound, vivid visual hallucinations and the hallucinations are quite vivid. They're well-formed, um, common things being bugs, animals, children, um, and they can be quite distressing as well. But the unique thing about Lewy body dementia is it can present with um, features that mimic Parkinson's disease or, or features of Parkinson's disease. So tremors, stiffness or rigidity, early falls, um, balance difficulty, slowness, um, which is why it is a cousin of Parkinson's disease. And the progression may be more rapid. And the typical story is that someone develops dementia or cognitive impairment, functional impairment, and Parkinson's within a year of one another. Finally, dementia is complicated and many diseases can contribute to dementia in one person. And we call that mixed dementia. The most common type of mixed dementia is Alzheimer's disease with vascular dementia. And that's purely because they're both very common and they often occur in combination. So um, really any combination of diseases that cause dementia can occur um, concurrently. And so we label it as a mixed dementia if that's the case. Mild cognitive impairment. So mild cognitive impairment, you can think about cognition as a spectrum. So we have normal cognition, mild cognitive impairment, and then dementia. And the distinguishing factor between mild cognitive impairment in dement and dementia is that mild cognitive impairment should not impair function. So you should remain independent in your daily activities. You have a decline in cognition that is um, more than expected for age alone. And that is determined with special cognitive tests that we use. And we compare you based on what um, sort of an average person of your age should score on those standardized tests. And so mild cognitive impairment is important to diagnose because it can signal a risk factor for developing dementia. And it allows us an opportunity to, an, to identify someone who should focus on those risk factors that we talked about. So if you've been diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, it's a great time to start looking at exercising, stopping smoking, um, making sure your blood pressure is in good control, making sure all your other medical issues are well optimized to do everything you possibly can to prevent progression to dementia. We know that mild cognitive impairment um, in some people can progress to dementia. We don't know with certainty how to accurately predict who will go on to develop dementia, but not everyone will develop dementia and that's important to note as well. So the big thing with mild cognitive impairment is it's not dementia, 
it can lead to dementia, but it's an opportunity to look at those risk factors and particularly those modifiable risk factors that we know also contribute to dementia risk. And some of those are listed here. So there are modifiable risk factors and non-modifiable risk factors. In other words, modifiable, we can change your risk by implementing treatments or interventions to reduce your risk. And then non-modifiable are things that we are born with and we can't change. So things like gender, age, um, unfortunately we can't change your age. So risk increases with age, um, certain genetic things. Unfortunately, if you're born with a genetic condition that can't be modified right now anyways. But the big thing to focus on are lifestyle factors. And that's there's growing evidence to support that, both um, in people who have normal cognition, but also those with mild cognitive impairment. And the thing with lifestyle factors are they are within our own control. And the majority of the risk factors that contribute to dementia are modifiable. So we should focus on those rather than the things that we can't change. So how do we reduce that risk? What, what do we need to do to do that? So I love this saying, cause it's so true. What's good for the heart is good for the brain. And it truly is, it, it is the truth. So if you think about all the things that you've learned about keeping a healthy heart, the same things help for a healthy brain. So the big things are exercise. And we know that, you know, most people should be doing about 150 minutes of moderate intensity aerobic exercise a week. But we, we should also be incorporating some strengthening exercises, balance exercises, and mind body things like meditation, prayer, yoga, whatever um, you are, um, you find helpful to you. Um, so physical activity is really important. Um, and also socialization. We, we're, we're learning more and more about social isolation in older adults and how it affects our health um, and it can lead to poor health outcomes um, and has been compared to that of smoking actually. So improving our social connectedness is so important and finding ways to do that during a pandemic can be challenging, but you know, utilizing technology, telephones, socially distanced visits, those are all really important. Other things are, you know, diet. So um, having a, a well-balanced diet, um, the Mediterranean diet has been shown to be um, healthy for the heart and also the brain. So minimizing our uh, sugary fast foods, focusing on all those good healthy fats, whole foods, whole grains, um, minimizing red meat, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, leafy greens. Um, those are all important aspects of our brain health as well. So how common is dementia? Um, so these statistics are from um, our own province, Saskatchewan. So we know that currently there's over 20,000 people living with dementia in our province. And I would estimate, or I would, I would actually, I think we're probably underestimating that number, knowing that we are probably under diagnosing people with dementia. We know that every 24 hours, 10 or more people develop dementia. And there's a lack of awareness of the warning signs beyond memory loss. And there are many warning signs that are important to note, and we're going to talk about them this evening. Um, but it's important to identify those warning signs so that we can diagnose. And I'll talk about the importance of diagnosis later on. So warning signs, you know, we know that dementia is about more than just memory. And we've talked about a couple types of dementia that I hope you can appreciate. Not all of them um, have memory as a part of the disease process. And in fact, some of them don't have memory at all included in the disease process, such as frontotemporal dementia. The um, College of Family Physicians of Canada um, have endorsed 10 evidence-based warning signs that are associated with dementia. And they are simple things to refer to if you notice a loved one, a family member, a friend 
who, who may be developing some signs. And it helps with um, timely diagnosis and ensuring that people are um, receiving the support and resources they need. We will go through these warning signs in detail, but in general, um, they can be categorized as the ABCs. So abilities, behavior, and communication. And I'm gonna to touch on all of these um, in more detail in the following slides. And, and uh, I would also mention that these were actually developed by physicians here in our own home province. So um, it's, um, there's some great work being done in Saskatchewan when it comes to um, dementia related advocacy. So what are the 10 warning signs? One thing that's important to note is whenever we're talking about cognitive changes, functional changes, or any sort of change in health, we always wanna look at what's normal for that individual and what has changed. So when we talk about these warning signs, it's important to note if there's been a change from normal function for that individual person. The first warning sign is the one that most of us think about is memory loss. And in particular, memory loss that affects day-to-day -day abilities. So, you know, it may be normal, you know, we all can be forgetful. We all have lapses in memory. We may miss a step or forget a piece of information. But if this is happening more frequently, um, and if it's more severe and it's compromising your ability to function day-to-day, -day, that's a warning sign. Um, also, you know, difficulty recalling information that has recently been learned repetitively, um, repetitive questioning. Um, those are all things that could signal um, something that something more might be happening. The second warning sign is difficulty performing familiar tasks. So um, again, a change from normal. So if if your grandmother was always, you know, the star baker with the cinnamon rolls, and then this year the cinnamon rolls were, were maybe a bit off, or maybe, you know, wasn't able to, to, to carry out that big Thanksgiving dinner as previous years, learn tasks that, you know, are familiar to an individual that slowly start to slip um, could be a warning sign of um, a dementia. Um, so looking out for sort of if mixing up the orders of steps or difficulty with sequences, um, forgetting entire components of a task that they may have previously been very good at. Those are all things to um, look into as possible warning signs. Disorientation in time and space. So it's, it's normal for all of us to forget the day of the week um, or, or um, you know, uh, the time, but but generally speaking, we should be you know oriented to the season, the year, the month, and we're often prompted or cued to know, oh, it's Tuesday today. Um, but if if people are having difficulty navigating familiar spaces, understanding concepts of time, you know, getting dressed with summer attire on a day like today, those would be warning signs that maybe there's something more going on. Misplacing objects. So we all, I mean, it's normal to set our keys down and then go into another room and forget where we put our keys, but, it, but that should come, it, we should be able to get cued back to finding those keys. If things are becoming more persistent and people are misplacing objects um, or putting them in inappropriate places, so non-perishable food items, um, or sorry, perishable food items in the pantry or, you know, putting a food item in an inappropriate spot, putting the remote control in the, in the refrigerator, those are all signs that maybe um, an individual is having difficulty. Um, another common thing that we see with dementia is misplacing things and then accusing loved ones or um, strangers of stealing. So filling in those gaps of, oh, I can't find my wallet. Oh, the mailman may have stolen it. So those are sort of warning signs where maybe there's some insight and judgment that are, that are being affected. Um, and that can be a sign of cognitive decline um, and dementia. Impaired judgment. And so um, this one's a tough one, but essentially looking at um, one's ability to 
sort of um, make decisions and act in good faith. Um, so um, if you're noticing that someone is becoming more impulsive with decisions, out of ordinary behavior, um, that's sort of uncharacteristic for them, if they're making sort of impulsive purchases, or, you know, we worry a lot about um, those who may become victims to scams. Um, those are things that could signal impaired judgment as a symptom of dementia. Changes in personality, mood, behavior. So this may be very subtle. It may be that someone is more withdrawn, less interested, maybe less talkative, um, or it may be the opposite. Someone doesn't have a filter anymore, but normally they were very polite and pleasant. Um, so any sort of change in normal personality behavior could be a sign of dementia. Loss of initiative. This is, this is a, an important one and it can be easily missed um, because, you know, the individual might not be reaching out as much. They may not be calling as much. And it's important to reach out to people who, who may be more withdrawn, um, losing initiative, because um, we don't want these people to, to fall through the cracks. But this can be a warning sign of dementia. Um, if someone's maybe not looking after themselves as well, their, their house used to be tidy and now they're kind of um, slipping when it comes to keeping their house neat, they're not buying food for themselves, they're needing cues and reminders to, to, to you know, go out and get groceries, to do their laundry, to shower, things like that. Um, loss of initiative can be a sign of dementia. Problems with language. So, you know, things like word finding difficulty or substituting words for other words that don't make sense or difficulty understanding language or communicating things. Those can all be signs of dementia. And of course, this, this needs to be a change from normal as we discussed with everything else. Problems with abstract thinking. Um, this, um, again, is, is also a tough one to, to pick out. But if you're finding that your loved one is having difficulty with um, uh, paying um, with currency or um, coming up with the right amount of change or being able to understand different types of dollar bills and coins, um, understanding how to interpret the clock or the time, you know, understanding how to use a remote control, things like that could be a signal that, you know, maybe there's some issues with abstract thinking that could be a sign of an underlying dementia. So those are some of the warning signs that, um, you know, you can, you can refer to. And of course, always reach out to your family physician or primary care provider if you or a loved one is noticing any changes with their um, cognition or function. Why do we care about warning signs? Well, we care because dementia is an important thing to recognize and early diagnosis is essential. It's important that we understand the signs and the symptoms. It's important that we diagnose it early and make sure we're ruling out any treatable causes as, we, as I spoke about earlier on in the talk. It's also extremely important that we diagnose early so we can connect you with the supports and a network that can help you through the journey of this um, uh, diagnosis. As we discussed, it's a, it can be a, a, a 10 year, 10 year plus disease, especially with Alzheimer's. So it's important to have those resources and supports um, by your side. And also for planning for the future, knowing that it's a, it's a disease that's progressive over time. We talked about the stages of Alzheimer's disease and all of the types of dementia go through various stages. And so for mild, moderate, severe, your needs may change. And it's important to plan for the future when those needs may change and when you may need more support. And finally, we wanna ensure that we provide counseling and um, strategies to help with the diagnosis. And although we don't have a cure for most um, types of dementia, uh, you know, there are many things we can do to help with your quality of life. 
How do we diagnose dementia? There's no single test. It's, it's a comprehensive assessment that needs to be done in order to determine a diagnosis of dementia. And it will generally include a thorough medical history, a physical exam where we will look at your heart, your lungs. We will check out a neurological exam, specifically looking for any signs of neurological disease, Parkinson's disease, et cetera. We also always need to do a cognitive screening test or a special type of assessment that assesses the different parts of the brain and the different cognitive domains that we alluded to earlier in this talk. Um, so assessing your memory, your language skills, your problem solving skills, your executive functioning skills. Um, that helps us with pattern recognition in determining type of dementia or the disease causing the dementia, certain blood tests, which helps us rule out any of those acute medical causes or things that can contribute to dementia that are treatable, like vitamin B12 deficiency or thyroid disease, for example. And then some people we refer on to do further cognitive testing or neuropsychological evaluations in people who we may not be sure of the type of dementia or if it is dementia, we, we, we send them to a neuropsychologist who can do some specialized, more comprehensive cognitive tests to help with the diagnosis. So getting a diagnosis, what should you share with your doctor? It's always important to bring a family member if you're noticing changes because it's helpful to have a third party kind of weigh in and talk about observations because certain things that they notice you may not notice. Um, it's important to talk about the time frame that things have been changing. So has it been over months or years? What are you able to do? You know, what are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And talking about sort of your medical history, any medications you're on, particularly um, prescription meds, but also over the counter meds. Do you have a history of depression or anxiety or any other psychiatric diagnosis? Because that can be important as well. Family history is important. And then as I, as I already mentioned, ensuring that we talk to family members, friends, caregivers, other people that you interact with on a daily basis that may also offer insight and assist your medical team with diagnosing you. And I'll, I'll refer you to the ABC Dementia toolkit and I know that um, my friends from the Alzheimer's Society, after I'm done speaking, will be speaking more about some of the resources you can access to assist you in navigating um, the, this uh, diagnosis. Treatment. So treatment for dementia, there are treatments that we offer to all types of dementia, um, education, um, support for the person with dementia and their family and caregiver all those healthy lifestyle things we talked about, exercise, diet, and then certain medications can be tried. There's no cure for dementia, but there are some medications that you may have heard about or read about that have been studied in people with dementia that may help with um, slowing the cognitive functional decline. Some of those medications that um, are on the market include Dinepazil or Aricept, uh, Rivastigmine or Exelon, and Galantamine or Reminil. Those three are all, um, they're, they're all under the same category. They're called cholinesterase inhibitors, and they are best studied in Alzheimer's disease. We know that people with Alzheimer's disease have a deficiency of a chemical in the brain or a neurotransmitter in the brain called acetylcholine. And the thought is that if you, if you block the breakdown of acetylcholine, you might be able to boost your acetylcholine levels in the brain, and that might help with the brain connections and improve your cognition. The effects of these medications are modest. Some people find that they benefit from them, others do not. Um, but it is worth a, a, a try if that's something that you wish to try. It's important to note though that they are not a cure. Um, they, they are purely for symptom management. Ibixa is another medication that is studied in Alzheimer's disease. It works a bit differently. Uh, the, the generic 
um, name for it is mimantine. It, it works a bit differently. It's an NMDA receptor antagonist, and it it helps boost glutamate, which is a type of messenger in the brain, chemical messenger in the brain that can help with those um, nerve connections and and um, the it, it helps with sort of the cognitive. Um, boosting your cognition, one might say. Um, again, it, it, the evidence is modest at best. It's not a cure or a miracle drug, but some people do benefit and it, it's worth a trial if um, it's within your wishes. Once you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease or any type of dementia, it's important to contact the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan. And although it's called the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan, they offer support and resources to all types of dementia. Um, every person diagnosed with dementia um, as part of their care plan should talk about future planning. And this is an evolving conversation that should start early in the disease process and will continue on throughout your journey with the disease. Um, an important thing to um, establish early on is a power of attorney. So essentially that allows someone you trust to make decisions on your behalf if you're unable to make those decisions. And that can be done while you're still alive. Healthcare directives, healthcare proxies are also important. Ensuring that you're documenting, documenting your wishes when it comes to medical care, so that if there were to come a time where you are unable to communicate your wishes, your family member or your proxy decision maker or your power of attorney knows that they've had those discussions with you and they are well documented and they're able to act in your best interests. Driving cessation. So we all have to retire from driving. It's not a matter of if, but when. There will come a time in your dementia journey that you will need to retire from driving. And that you know, tends to occur once the disease is affecting the parts of the brain that are necessary for driving. And so that's something that you, you will discuss with your, fam with your um, physician, your primary care provider. Um, medication management, so you might start to need assistance with that. Blister packing medications can be a helpful memory aid, or you might even need home care to remind you to take your medications. And then your living environment may also change as you um, embark on the disease journey. Um, and so many people with dementia are still living in their homes and they're supported with home care or a family member, but you may um, want to start having the discussion and planning for the future in the event that you may need more care, such as in a personal care home or in long-term care. So those are all things to, to plan for, for the future, knowing that every type of dementia is a progressive disease that in time will lead to further functional um, decline. So with that, I think I will pass the mic on to uh, my friends at the Alzheimer's Society to speak on some of the um, resources available to you. Alrighty. Thank you so much, Dr. Lajmoudi. I really appreciate what you've been sharing. So at this point, I'm going to cover a few slides here. But if you want to put a question into that Q&A while I'm talking, feel free to do so. And uh, my coworkers will start to look at those questions and organize them in a way that we can present them to Dr. Lajmoudi in just a few minutes. So. Again, just a reminder to please keep your questions relevant to tonight's topics. Uh, Dr. Lajmordier is not able to diagnose or treat anybody here tonight. Uh, so just to keep your questions relevant to what she has shared for clarification or those sorts of things. So anyway, the Alzheimer's Society, this is our vision and our mission. So a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias and our mission is the Alzheimer's Society of Saskatchewan empowers people to live well with dementia while funding research into prevention, cures, and quality of life. Just a couple things to note is that we are a board-directed charity that was incorporated in 1982. And as Dr. Laz Mordier said, you do not need to have Alzheimer's disease in order to come to us for help and support. Um, you also don't need to have that formal diagnosis, although we do encourage you to do that and we certainly can 
help you um, get the information together in order to do that. But we are here to provide support, education, and resources to people affected by many types of dementia. Can you go to the next slide? Thank you. Our programs and services since uh, the pandemic hit and back last March, uh, and we all headed home to work from home and no more in-person visits and meetings, uh, we still continue to provide support, individual and family support over the telephone or through email. We also have many of our programs have been moved to online, such as this. A year ago, we would have been meeting via telehealth across the province and in person to deliver this presentation. So we have moved a lot of our programs to on, an online, online format, such as our Minds in Motion is a virtual program. We have telephone support groups. We have a coffee and chat once a week where uh, people living with dementia and their support or family members join with people from across the province to have coffee every Friday morning. And we talk about all sorts of things at that coffee and chat from puffed wheat square recipes to the Rough Riders and oh, you name it, we talk about it. We also provide um, learning series. So coming up in the next couple of weeks, we have a couple of our progressive learning series happening. Our Care Essentials will be taking place in February. And in March, we have a program called First Steps. And so if you're looking for more information about those events or anything else that we have going on, you can go to our website and to the programs and events page on our website. Our evenings of education are also part of our programs and services. So like tonight, and we have another evening coming up in February um, around driving and dementia. And I'll touch on that again at the very end here. And then typically we would do community presentations. What's happened in the last 10 months is our, pro our uh, public awareness coordinator. She has been uh, delivering the ABCs of dementia presentations a couple of times a month. So again, you can find out more information about that on our website. Next slide, please. So research, uh, the Alzheimer's Society does help fund the Alzheimer's Society of Canada research. So funds uh, from this program cover and focus on area, uh, many areas, identifying potential new drugs for Alzheimer's disease, using neuroimaging techniques to distinguish different forms of dementia, studying how diet and other lifestyle choices may delay the disease, developing technology to enhance the quality of life, um, care and safety for people affected, improving care delivery in the community and in long-term care settings. And so through research evidence is growing that you can lower your risk in developing dementia through the lifestyle changes, including healthy eating, regular physical activity, not smoking, maintaining cardiovascular health and being mentally active. And so uh, we, I know we sound like broken records here tonight talking about those modifiable risks, but that's an area where they do a lot of research around. And so we're not just telling you that to be mean, it's a res, um, evidence-based research. Next slide. Not only do we um, support research on a, a national level, but we also fund research right here in Saskatchewan. And so over the last 10 years, we've been uh, in partnership with the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation and the University of Saskatchewan. We have just completed 10 years of funding of Dr. Daryl Musso, the gentleman in this picture. Um, he was the Re Saskatchewan Research Chair in Alzheimer's disease and dementia. And so Together with, with these organizations, we've provided $2 million in funding over the last 10 years to support him in his research as he was studying the link between Alzheimer's disease and depression. And we're now in a new partnership with the Saskatchewan Health Research Foundation again to fund the Research Solutions Program with a focus on research into diagnosis and the prevention and lowering the risks of developing dementia. The Alzheimer's Society also funds a $5,000 graduate scholarship, uh, student scholarship at the Center of Aging and Health at the University of Regina um, to a graduate student who's conducting dementia related research. Besides this, we also support um, many researchers right here in Saskatchewan and across the, the country by 
playing a key role in connecting people with lived experience of dementia with the to the researchers who are conducting this research. And so if you get an email or a phone call from one of our staff asking if you might be interested in participating in a, a research project, um, that's what we will typically do. But, and we'll never share your information with the researchers without your permission. But we do try to be that conduit to connect people um, to the researchers so that they have that lived experience. Next slide, please. And I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about money. Uh, as I said before, we are a not-for-profit organization charity. Um, so we do love our donors. Three out of our four dollars in our budget does come from donors. And it's because of the generosity of donors before you that we can offer events such as this tonight at no cost to you. And there will be a link in the uh, follow-up email that you receive to make a donation if you choose to do so. But so we would ask that you would consider to donate to our organization to benefit um, future events so that we can continue to deliver the five pillars that you see listed on here, the support, education, awareness, advocacy, and research. Next slide, please. And here we are. This is where you can find us across the province. In 2019, 2020, we served over 3,000 people in 290 communities across Saskatchewan. So if you have any questions or concerns or you know, something's not answered tonight, uh, please contact our dementia helpline, which the number is there, or one of our resource centers. And they are located at these sites across the province, Swift Current, Prince Albert, Regina, Battleford, Saskatoon, Estevan, and Yorkton. We aren't a, a crisis line, uh, so we are available though Monday to Friday, 8.30 to 4.30 at these locations. Our provincial office and dementia helpline are both located in Regina. So, um, but we are all working virtually from home right now, so uh, we, but we're still here to offer that support to you. So with that, I think I'm, if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to, I'm going to turn my mic and uh, camera off here and turn it over to Jennifer and Arianna and they'll present some questions to you. Okay, we have quite a few questions, so I'm hoping we can get through, um, through a lot of them. So can we start with maybe some on types of dementia? What is un unspecified? unspecific dementia? Mm -hmm. So unspecified dementia. So essentially that's a very generic term to essentially describe someone who maybe there's uncertainty around the diagnosis. We know that they have dementia and that there's some cognitive changes and um, functional changes associated with those cognitive changes, but there may be uncertainty about the type of dementia. And it may just be that the, the clinician needs more time to really determine what the disease is. Um, so unspecified dementia, um, it should just be a temporary label until you receive a, a diagnosis or a, a disease diagnosis. Um, with um, MCI, mild cognitive impairment, how long could a person stay at that stage? And does it always develop into dementia? That's a good question. So um, again, not everyone with mild cognitive impairment progresses to dementia. Many people live with mild cognitive impairment for until they die and they never develop dementia. Typically we quote that, you know, if you have mild cognitive impairment, there's about a 10% chance per year that you may develop dementia, but that we're not clear on who will progress. So I think the, the easy answer is that um, you could live many years with mild cognitive impairment and never develop dementia and others may develop dementia within a few years. And there are certain types of mild cognitive impairment that would make me worried of someone potentially progressing to dementia. Um, but in general, it, it, it's really tough to know. All I can say is if you have mild cognitive impairment, 
that is a great time to really focus on optimizing your health, particularly blood pressure, making sure you don't start smoking if you're not already a smoker, making sure you're choosing those healthy lifestyle choices like regular exercise, um, healthy diet, those sorts of things. Great. Um, when it comes to the diagnosis, pro diagnosis process, um, can you talk a little more about brain scans and CTs and MRIs for that diagnosis? Sure, I'm happy to. So I hope you, I'm sure you all noticed that we don't include neuroimaging or brain imaging as part of the diagnosis. It's not a necessity to diagnose dementia, although we often do order or neuroimaging or brain scans to help us rule out big things like tumors, strokes, um, things like that. We can also look at the brain because certain patterns of brain damage point to certain types of dementia. So for example, in Alzheimer's disease, there's a very typical pattern of atrophy or brain loss that we see on a CT scan. Um, similarly with frontotemporal dementia, there are certain features that we can see on neuroimaging. And then with some of the more rare types of dementia, like Lewy body dementia, um, there are certain functional imaging scans we can do like PET scans or SPECT scans that can help us look at um, certain parts of the brain that might be metabolizing glucose differently or certain parts of the brain that don't have the same blood flow that we'd expect. So although um, brain scans are not um, used as a sole way to diagnose dementia, they are just an added um, clue and can support a diagnosis based on certain findings. Okay. Um, let's see here. Could we talk about maybe the value or the evidence of essential care partners in long-term care for those residents living with dementia and the value of that? Yeah, so I, oh, I, our caregivers are a member of the, of the healthcare team. They are not visitors, they are essential workers on the healthcare team looking after those with dementia. And so caregivers, I think, deserve um, that recognition and respect because they are essential to good care for those with dementia. And in particular in long-term care where we know that um, you know, people are stretched very thin when it comes to care aides and nurses, having those caregivers involved with the day-to-day -day care is very important. And the best type of care for dementia is what we, what we call non-pharmacological or non-medication approaches. And so, Yes, care, caregiving is an essential part. And um, I think it's important that we, we support our caregivers um, and check in on them to ensure that they um, have the resources they need to provide that care. But also understanding that it's okay to just be a wife or a child or a granddaughter or a grandson. Um, you, you may need to take a step back and allow others to take over some of that caregiving as well. So you can just be a loved one to your um, partner or parent. So um, yeah, caregiving, very important. And they are an essential member of the, the care team. Um, just trying to see which ones are, we've got so many varied questions. Um, can, vision, can vision deteriorate as part of dementia? Um, the the person asking says that her mom is not able to read anymore, but the optometrist says there's nothing wrong with her eyes. Hmm. That's a that's a good question. Um, it's tough. To, it's tough to know. Um, certainly, we know that certain types of dementia can affect the vision parts of the brain, and so although it may not be a problem with the eye itself, it may be how she's processing information in the brain. So, um, although I can't comment specifically on that particular individual, um, the, the cognitive function that's involved in visual processing can be impaired in dementia, but dementia itself shouldn't actually affect the eye itself. So if there's a structural problem with the eye, that would be an opth ophthalmologist that would look into that. We also know that age in itself, you know, increased risk of macular, macular degeneration, glaucoma as well. So it could be age-related eye disease as well, but yeah. Okay. 
Uh, besides having an appointment with your family physician to make the diagnosis, what other professionals and tests would you need to see or have done um, in order to get a diagnosis? Yeah, so generally speaking, you know, many family physicians and even nurse practitioners, um, primary care providers are able to diagnose dementia if they're, you know, aware of the signs and symptoms and, and have some training in how to assess and diagnose dementia. For people who, you know, may not be comfortable with making the diagnosis, they can refer to a specialist in dementia care. And many of us sort of share that um, expertise. So neurology or neurologists, many neurologists um, see people with dementia, uh, geriatricians like myself, dementia is part of our sort of bread and butter. Um, and then there are other people as well that um, may have a special interest in dementia, but generally speaking, family doctors, neurologists, geriatricians, as well as some psychiatrists, particularly geriatric psychiatrists, um, are all able to diagnose and assess for dementia. As far as other tests, um, you know, you can be diagnosed with dementia just by a physician, but sometimes we call on our colleagues in psychology, uh, particularly neuropsychology, to do more cognitive testing to help us with the diagnosis, especially in those cases that might be more complicated or more rare. Um, those are some of the professionals that might be involved in your um, dementia diagnosis process. Great. Can you talk about more um, the connection between depression and dementia? Um, and the question asker um, mentions both depression and dementia seem to be underdiagnosed, perhaps because they both tend to carry unnecessary stigma. And is it common to have for people to have both at once? Yeah, thank you for that question. That's a that's an excellent question. Um, the answer is complicated. So yes, depression can lead to dementia, and um, dementia can lead to depression. So it's sort of a question of chicken or the egg. We know that depression, untreated depression is a risk factor for dementia, but we also know that people with dementia commonly develop depression and it can present differently. It might present with um, more responsive behaviors or agitation. Um, it may present with more withdrawn, maybe not eating. Um, so it can be, it, it takes some detective work, but it's, it's so important to identify depression and treat it. And you're right, it is, un, it's, it's not diagnosed as well in older adults because older adults tend to present differently. So they often don't present with sadness or guilt like many people do with depression. It may be very subtle. It may be they're not cooking for themselves as much. They're more irritable, um, they may be falling, um, they may have functional decline. So we know that older adults present differently in atypical ways. And so depression is underdiagnosed. And I think part of that comes down to um, lack of awareness and knowledge of how older adults present and also the stigma associated with it and knowing that depression is very common in older adults and they respond to treatment very well. And I think people are always scared to start treatment, but arguably older adults probably respond better to treatment than younger adults, um, generally speaking. So it's always important to identify it and to treat it. Another question here, um, how young can people experience dementia? And with that, uh, can past drug use lead to dementia and, um, is, is there a link between addiction and higher risk? That's a, that's a very good question. I don't know if I have a, a clear answer for you, but so uh, what was the first part of the question? Um, how young can a person uh, experience dementia? Yeah, so, you know, being in geriatric medicine, I, I tend, I specialize in the care of older adults. So I'm biased in that all the patients I see are generally over the age of 65, but dementia can occur at young ages as well. You know, people as young as 30, 40 can have genetic um, forms of dementia. Um, we call it early onset dementia. Um, and um, those individuals, you know, certain types of diseases like Huntington's disease, Down syndrome can lead to dementia earlier on in life. 
So dementia is not just a disease of old age, it's a disease that can span the entire lifespan, but typically um, in adult life. Um, as far as addiction goes, um, you know, certainly we know that alcohol um, and alcohol addiction, alcohol is a, there's a very clear link between alcohol and dementia. Alcohol is actually neurotoxic to the brain cells. So it leads to damage to the brain and permanent damage to the brain. Um, some of the um, effects of addiction, so IV drug use can predispose one to developing things like HIV and hepatitis C, which also contribute to dementia risk and can cause dementia. And um, so as far, as far as specific drugs that lead to dementia, I don't know if we have great evidence that there's a link between you know, heroin or cocaine, for example, lead, causing dementia, but certainly they can lead to toxic effects to the brain in the acute period. Um, but certainly alcohol, there's a strong link, HIV, hepatitis C, which are associated with IV drug use can contribute to dementia. Are there medications that can be used to help with responsive behaviors, for example, aggression um, and anxiety? Or what if you chose not to do that? What would be some non-pharmacological options? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a great question. There are many behaviors that we see with dementia and it can range very broadly from you know, mood related symptoms like depression, anxiety, responsive behaviors that, you know, the term responsive behavior is a, is a better descriptor. Um, oftentimes people describe it as aggression or agitation, but really it's a responsive behavior to an unmet need. Um, paranoia, suspiciousness, wandering, calling out. There are so many types of behaviors and not all of them respond to medication, but the ones that do, so things like um, paranoia or hallucinations, delusions, anxiety, depression. We, we use medications to treat that. So antidepressants or antipsychotics. But the first thing to always try is non-medication approaches. And the reason being is a lot of the meds that are used for those have side effects and we like to avoid those side effects. So things that are non-pharmacologic or non-medication related would include things like involving caregivers, coming up with a personalized care plan for that patient, depending on the behavior. So for example, if they tend to, um, we call it wandering, but if they tend to kind of get lost or like to pace or whatnot, maybe keeping them busy with an activity, um, ensuring that we're um, uh, camouflaging doors and doorways. Um, th th there's many things we can do. And oftentimes I rely on my nursing colleagues and people who specialize in those behavioral management techniques to come up with a care plan that's gonna be individualized and personalized for the patient. Um, music therapy has also been shown to be effective for some of those responsive behaviors in certain people. Um, um, exercise, sort of keeping people um, engaged with, with activities. Um, so a number of things that can be tried and it's always important to try those non-pharmacological things first before we move to medications. Any suggestions for young athletes who may have had brain trauma during their sporting careers, um, what they can do to minimize the effects of dementia or the possibility of getting dementia in later in life? Yeah, so we're, we're learning more and more about that. Um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy is the term or CTE or you know, a, a type of dementia that um, develops in those with repeated head injury and, you know, common sports like boxing, hockey, football. The, the best answer to that would be preventing head trauma in the first place. So ensuring that they're wearing proper um, equipment, helmets, et cetera. Once the head trauma occurs repeatedly, a lot of that damage has already been done. And you know, as far as I know, there's not um, anything available right now that really reverses that damage. So really it's a matter of preventing the damage in the first place and ensuring that you know, young athletes are wearing the proper personal protective equipment, um, knowing that repeated head trauma in those high contact sports has been shown to um, lead to um, a very severe type of dementia. 
we've gotten a lot of questions. So I'm going to about denial or the person with suspected dementia or who has been diagnosed with dementia, not seeing it in themselves, but the family seeing those, those, those obvious things that, that that's happening. Um, how should people handle that? Or what are some suggestions? Yeah, that can be very challenging and it's common and it's part of the disease itself. So as the cognition becomes impaired, insight can become impaired. So the individual who's experiencing the cognitive changes may not have the ability to have insight into those changes. And oftentimes it is family that notices those changes. Um, as far as how to handle that, it's, it's challenging. I, I would say there are great resources that the Alzheimer's Society could likely provide as far as how to communicate with people with dementia. It's always best to not argue or um, be confrontational, but sort of meet them where they're at. And, you know, ensuring that you're involved with any um, appointments with um, physicians, nurse practitioners regarding that diagnosis, because you're, as a caregiver observing, you're going to be the one who's going to be instrumental in assisting the care team with diagnosing that individual with uh, possible dementia. So yes, it's very common. It's a challenging thing to, to deal with. And I'd, I'd encourage you to reach out to um, the Alzheimer's Society regarding communication tools and things that can help with navigating um, that lack of insight that comes with the cognitive decline. Great. Is, who is the best to do the assessment for dementia? Oh, who's the best? I like not like maybe in general terms of the best, not necessarily a specific doctor or. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I have a good answer for that. I think um, there are many family physicians that have, you know, good interest have you know strong interest in dementia and have a lot of experience um there are uh, neurologists that have special training in dementia there are geriatricians who you know have a niche of dementia so i, I don't know if I have, I have a good answer for that i think everyone has a different lens um in that um we all train a bit differently as far as how our foundation is but um at the end of the day the the, the approach to dementia care shouldn't vary too much across specialties. So it really is going to come down to who you're comfortable with. And I think that's the most important thing is you want to trust the physician you're working with and you want to be able to feel comfortable um, talking about some very sensitive issues. And so the best person is probably going to depend on the individual. So if you have a good relationship with your family doctor, and they're comfortable with making a diagnosis, they would likely be the best person. If um, you, you're someone who likes to have a second opinion or um, wants to see a specialist, then uh, a specialist may be a better fit for you, but all in all, it's gonna depend on you as an individual and just trusting the fact that, you know, there are many people um, who, who are good at dementia care. It's just finding the right fit for you. Um, on medication, um, are there drugs that are, are medications that are only offered at certain stages of the disease? Um, or what makes someone maybe a candidate for some of these dementia drugs? Yeah, so I'll, I'll be honest and say that there are these dementia drugs that they don't come without side effects. So there are many people that unfortunately cannot be on the medications. Um, one of the most common side effects of the cholinesterase inhibitors is it can slow the heart rate and it can actually lead to heart block where you need a pacemaker. So that's a dangerous side effect and people who have, you know, already have some heart disease or difficulty with the electrical system of the heart, in other words, conduction disease, we call it, they may not be a candidate for a cholinesterase inhibitor. Um, typically we say that the best time to try these medications is in the mild to moderate stage of the disease. Once you reach the severe um, late stages of the disease, we, we, we don't tend to see the same benefit. Um, that being said, there are people who are on these medications from the onset of the diagnosis and they continue on it until they're 
in the severe stages of the disease. And so it really depends on the individual, but generally speaking, um, tends to be most beneficial in the mild to moderate stages. And it's important to note that not everyone is a candidate because of the potential side effects, particularly on the heart, but also many people don't tolerate these medications. They can cause weight loss, diarrhea is a common side effect. And so it really depends on the individual and oftentimes we'll start at a really low dose and gradually go up. And if they don't tolerate it, I often just stop it because the benefits are so modest that you know, it's, it's not going to be a miracle drug or, or drastically change the trajectory of your disease, but it can help some people with sort of um, uh, modest effects on improving cognition and function. Um, if someone asking, what is the benefit of having a regular um, MMSE or other memory screening for someone who is asymptomatic, but it has a family history of Alzheimer's disease or other dementias? Hmm. Yeah, so whenever we talk about screening or using a screening test, which is what the MMSE would be, it's essentially a cognitive screening tool. It's, it's not gonna be helpful in someone who's asymptomatic. And it may um, give you a score that, that worries you or makes you anxious, but it's not going to change anything because in your day-to-day -day life, life, you're functioning well and you're, and you're functioning well. But if, if you start to notice symptoms and you have a family history of Alzheimer's, then I would encourage you to, to have a screening cognitive test done. But if you're asymptomatic and you just have a family history, I would focus more on those lifestyle things, those modifiable risk factors. So the exercise, the diet, the making sure your blood pressure is well controlled, making sure your medical issues are well controlled. And if you start to develop cognitive symptoms, that's when I would look at doing a cognitive assessment or a screening test. Perfect. Um, does, is there a connection between hearing loss and dementia? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's, there's growing evidence that um, hearing impairment can contribute to cognitive decline and dementia. And um, as far as the, how strong that link is, it's tough to know, but there's certainly evidence to support that untreated hearing impairment can contribute to dementia. So generally what we recommend is that if you have hearing impairment, especially in your middle-aged years, so we're learning that the changes that lead to dementia often occur decades before the diagnosis. So you know, the changes are occurring kind of in your middle-aged years. And so that's the time to really focus on those lifestyle measures, those risk factors and hearing impairment being one of them. So ensuring that you're seeing an audiologist getting fitted for hearing aids if you have hearing impairment, because it um, is possibly linked to dementia. So it's better to treat it um, than, um, have that potential risk of contributing to uh, dementia later on. This question is really good. Um, is there one thing that you would want all the members of the general public to know about dementia? What would it be? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, oh, I have to think about that. I would like people to know that dementia there are many people living with dementia in the community that continue to live very fulfilling lives. And I think that's important to note. I think oftentimes when people hear the word dementia, they automatically think long-term care, end of life. But I'd like people to know that there are many people living with dementia in the community who are still living very active, fulfilling lives. And it truly is a a disease that is diverse and is a journey and it's very individual based on the person. And I'd also like people to note that dementia is not a part of normal aging. So those would be kind of the two things I would um, write home. Um, a lot of questions about um, if patients wanted to be referred to you. Um, I think you provided such great information that people would like to, to maybe refer to you or reach out to you. Is there a process? 
How do people get in touch with you? Um, that, that's an excellent question. And I'm still trying to figure that out myself. So um, I, I just started my practice in the summer and um, working through um, building my outpatient clinical practice. I would say in the meantime, referrals, you can speak with your family doctor and a referral can be sent to GEM um, at City Hospital. So geriatric evaluation and management. And um, I will work together with the team at GEM to, to, to kind of um, address those referrals as they come. Um, as far as a definitive plan for my outpatient clinic practice, I'm, I'm working on it. So I'll leave it at that. But referrals can be sent to GEM in the meantime. Um, based on the importance of socialization, what new ways are you or healthcare providers uh, developing to help patients do that? Um, as the, the writer is um, wise, she's plus there plus 80, um, and online is difficult. Yeah, so socialization, very important. And um, I think we need to think about new creative strategies to improve our social connectedness among older adults, knowing that not everyone is going to be tech savvy and not everyone is gonna have access to a computer. Um, as far as things that I'm doing personally or people I know, colleagues, you know, people are working on various innovative ways to improve social connectedness through like various apps and other techno technological uh, means of doing that. Um, in a non-COVID world, having those community programs, community exercise classes um, are super important. And, you know, I'm very hopeful that, you know, we will soon be back to that where we can have those community programs open up for older adults to improve that social connectedness. Um, and, you know, ensuring that you know, as, as someone who may know of an older adult who may be living alone, reaching out to them as well and thinking about um, checking in on those who may not have um, family or as many um, supports in Saskatoon and making sure we're all looking out for one another and um, knowing that, you know, socialization is so important for not just um, cognitive health or brain health, but just general health and our well-being. And from the Alzheimer's Society, um, when COVID has passed and we open our doors again and we're able to see people, we do offer Minds in Motion, which is an exercise program plus a social time after, and it's it's a lot of fun. And we also have coffee clubs and support groups, and we offer a lot of opportunity for socialization with the Alzheimer's Society. That's awesome. Um, what is the difference between usual stroke recovery and vascular dementia? Mm, that's a good question. So typically after a big stroke, um, it's not uncommon after a stroke to see some um, changes in cognition and they may be temporary. Um, but, you know, I, I'm off the top of my head, I can't think of the numbers, but I would estimate, you know, about 10% of people with a big stroke will eventually develop dementia later on. So the, the recovery differs. So typically, if you're not going to develop dementia, you should, um, within a few months, recover to a point where you may still have some cognitive changes, but it's not interfering with your day-to-day -day function. If it's impairing your daily function and the cognition is severe enough to do that, um, that's when we would kind of call it more of a dementia. And usually, um, we wait at least six months um, after a stroke before we really call it dementia because we want to see kind of what that recovery might look like, sometimes even up to a year. But generally speaking, um, time will tell sort of um, how you do. And um, it's really about patience and, and follow up. And um, I hope that answers the question. Um. Another question, how accurate is a diagnosis of dementia by an emergency room physician? Mm -hmm. That's tough for me to answer. I would say that um, without knowing the context, it's hard to know. Um, as long as an, a physician is getting, you know, 
a, a comprehensive assessment done. So, you know, a thorough physical history, collateral history, meaning getting information from um, uh, family members or people that may have observed the individual and, and understanding the timeline of events. Um, if you have all those information, if you have all that information and you've ruled out any sort of acute medical reason for the cognitive changes, so infection, um, you know, any sort of cardiac problem, any sort of acute medical problem that needs to be treated. Um, as long as you've kind of ruled all that out and the story is suggestive, I would say that any physician with knowledge of dementia can diagnose dementia. I would caution though that, you know, oftentimes in the emergency room, it's not usually our best day. We're usually there because of an acute problem. And we like to assess dementia when people are at their best. So it's often best to assess dementia, usually in an outpatient setting, um, when there's not distractions and the potential for any acute medical issues. So in that particular instance, although um, a physician in hospital may look at someone and be suspicious of dementia, uh, a, a, a diagnosis um, may not be made at that time, but it may um, be important to to flag the suspicion and then have follow up later as an outpatient with either your family doctor or a specialist in dementia to really confirm the diagnosis, ensuring that there's no confounding factors like a busy emergency room, distractions, acute medical problems. Um, what can be done to help remove the stigma associated with dementia? Yeah, so that's a great question. What we're doing this evening, I, I hope, will remove some of that stigma. I think a lot of it comes down to raising awareness and educating the public on dementia, um, understanding that it's a diverse, it's, it's, a, it's a very generic term, and there's various diseases that lead to dementia, and um, the, the, the disease itself, um, sorry, dementia on its own is not a disease. It's, it's, it's describes a, a collection of diseases that can lead to cognitive and functional decline. So I think reducing stigma largely comes down to educating the public, talking about it, empowering individuals to seek out um, a diagnosis, seek out support through the Alzheimer's Society or other support groups, and ensuring that we're supported pe supporting people with dementia and um, engaging them with, um, you know, our with society and including them in um, activities that meet their needs. So um, education is a big one and just having those discussions and asking the questions and um, yeah, that is how I would say reducing the stigma. And I know the Alzheimer's Society does a lot of work with that as well. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you talk a little about delirium? and how that could be maybe confused as a dementia? Yeah, so that's a great question. I, I see delirium a lot. So delirium is very common, especially um, in the work that I do at RUH, seeing people admitted to hospital. So delirium is an acute confusional state. You can also think of it as acute brain failure. So um, you may know of someone with um, heart failure or kidney failure, delirium is essentially brain failure. And it is a um, reversible condition, meaning it is due to something acute. So it's a medical emergency, it's a medical problem. And common causes of delirium are things like bad infections, like a pneumonia or sepsis, um, uh, having a heart attack can lead to delirium, having, you know, acute kidney injury or, um, you know, electrolyte disturbances in the blood, um, toxins like alcohol or other drugs can lead to delirium. Certain medications that can affect the brain can lead to delirium. And COVID-19, we know 30% um, of older adults, actually their only presenting complaint is, or their only presenting symptom is delirium with COVID. So delirium is very important and we know that um, old age increases the risk of getting delirium, especially if you're unwell and sick. But we know that people with dementia are also at an increased risk of delirium. And you can think of it as, as if you have dementia, you have somewhat of a vulnerable brain. And so if you have a medical insult onto the brain, 
you're going to be more prone to developing delirium or acute brain failure. Delirium is usually treatable if you treat the underlying cause of the delirium, but it can be a very serious condition. It can last weeks to months. And we know that people that have delirium in hospital, delirium is a risk factor for developing dementia. And so it's very important that we diagnose delirium, we identify it in hospital, and more importantly, we should be preventing delirium. And there's many ways we can do that in hospital. And it's something that's within my expertise to prevent because we know delirium is associated with bad outcomes, particularly dementia, functional decline, more likely to lose independence and be discharged to a nursing home. And so it's, it's, it's a serious problem and it's very common. And there's a lot of work we can do to prevent it. And it's some of the work I'm advocating for in, in the hospitals anyways, implementing standardized protocols to prevent delirium and especially in those who are vulnerable, such as those with dementia. So it's different from dementia in that delirium is, a, is an acute problem. It usually occurs over days to weeks, hours, days to weeks. It's an acute change from baseline and it's usually fluctuant. And so in someone with dementia who may have an abrupt change in cognition, they might be more drowsy, they might be very confused compared to baseline, you, that should prompt you to maybe um, see a medical professional to look for any underlying medical reason for that change. Great. Um, does stress or related inflammation increase the risk of dementia? Yeah, so that's that's a good question. I think it's tough to define. Um, it's tough to define, you know, what level of stress, you know, what level of inflammation, it's hard to know, but much of what we know about dementia and much of what we know about many diseases, including cardiovascular disease, renal disease, it, 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 it all comes down to sort of abnormal inflammation in, in the body. Um, and we know that with age, um, there's certain changes that happen as we age that um, make us prone to sort of baseline sort of pro-inflammatory markers that can affect our organs like the heart, the kidneys, the brain. And so I suspect that inflammation does play a role in many of the types of diseases that lead to dementia. Um, it's just figuring out kind of how do we treat that? How do we target that? And that's something that we don't know yet. So the simple answer is yes, certain stress inflammation is underlying a lot of diseases um, and, and diseases that cause dementia in particular. But how do we treat that? It's hard to know. Really, it probably comes down to really addressing all those risk factors that we've talked about and um, you know, the exercise, the diet, um, the making sure you're a healthy weight, not smoking, because all those things can contribute to inflammation and that can contribute to disease. So. Um, okay, here's one about the length of time from the start of the first appointment with concerns at the doctor um, to the end, like going through the steps listed on the diagnosis slide that we had um, that you would get a diagnosis. So, you know, that first appointment where you're kind of diagnosis curious to getting that diagnosis, how long does that normally take? Hmm sort of from the time of symptoms to diagnosis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it really varies. Oftentimes it's not uncommon for people to present to me and once I've been chatting with them for a while or chatting with their family member, um, they start to think in retrospect and think, you know, I think changes were occurring two years ago. So oftentimes changes were occurring for years prior to the point where, you know, they reach medical, they seek medical attention. Not always, but oftentimes there's been changes occurring for longer than when we've diagnosed. So that's why it's so important to kind of pick up on those warning signs that we talked about today in the PowerPoint, because that can help you with sort of early signs that may um, allow you to seek medical advice earlier but it's not uncommon for people to present you know months or years even um, after there's been some cognitive changes and it's only until a crisis happens or 
a major um, issue happens that they present to a doctor. Um, does speech language therapy help with someone with dementia with their speaking skills and maybe their language, um, keeping their language? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we know that there are certain types of dementia that um, are um, the parts of the brain that is affected is the language center. And that there are many types, but, you know, Alzheimer's disease, for example, can affect language. And there are certain, um, we didn't really touch on this, but there are certain variants of Alzheimer's disease, one variant known as logopenic Alzheimer's disease, which um, tends to really affect language. And so, yes, we, 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 we do refer to, to SLP or speech language pathology because they, they are the experts in providing sort of those communication strategies and helping with other ways of communicating with those with dementia who may have aphasia or um, language issues as a prominent feature. Um, so yeah, certainly it's always great to get um, them involved. And uh, the big message I wanna send is that dementia care truly is a team sport. Um, we, we rely on everyone um, from, you know, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, social work, um, uh, you know, Alzheimer's society and people in the community like CPAS workers, care aides, nurses, family members. Um, I'm sure I'm missing people, but it, it truly is a team sport and finding the, the right person for the job to assist with the various aspects of dementia care that are important, so. Now, I know you're new at your practice in Saskatchewan, but where would someone find a list of specialized providers who would be um, for dementia care? Hmm. I don't know if a list exists for dementia care per se, um, and that might be a good idea moving forward, but um, really it's gonna be a matter of sort of word of mouth and um, your, your family physician or your primary care provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner or family doctor, um, they should be able to navigate that and find out who the right person is to refer to. So uh, although there are only um, three geriatricians in the province, um, there are many neurologists who accept referrals for dementia. Um, and then again, as I mentioned, many family doctors as well are able to diagnose dementia. But as far as specialist providers, I don't think there's a list available, but um, speaking to your primary care provider would be the, a, a good first step because they can help um, find that out for you. Um, do you have any information on how a person with dementia could deal with grief? Um, might be Connie, we might be able to give some Alzheimer's Society after Dr. Lang Mojir. Yeah, I might, I might actually pass the mic to Connie because <laughs> I, I, that's a great question. And I, I don't, I'm not familiar with any um, uh, specific resources to those with dementia, but I think it's an important topic. So maybe I'll pass that on to Connie. Yeah, we do have a few, uh, well, we have one resource around ambiguous loss and grief. Um, and we certainly could talk with the person living with dementia about, uh, about grief and those sorts of things. We also can talk with family members and give them some strategies and some uh, ways of, of talking about grief or even naming grief for the person living with dementia. Because if for often for the person with dementia, they may not recognize it as grief the same way you or I do. Um, so we can certainly help strategize with family members on, on how to address that or how do you acknowledge the grief uh, or help the person living with dementia acknowledge the grief. We also are hoping um, to have one of our upcoming evenings of education to talk about grief. So just watch for, for that as well. And I think we have time for, let's go with one more question. We've had questions just flying in here, but we'll do one more question and then we'll wrap things up. Kind of maybe on with COVID, um, that the question is, of course, there's not much research done yet about the effects 
of COVID, the long-term effects, um, do you think that the brain fog that people are experiencing following, following COVID um, could result in permanent damage um, and lead to dementia? Mm, that's a good question. Uh, and yeah, I don't have a good answer yet. I think it certainly raises questions. We know that, especially though, we know that delirium is a presenting feature of COVID and we know that delirium leads to dementia. So um, I think that link is very clear. And I, and I do worry about um, people who've developed severe delirium in the context of COVID-19, what that's going to mean um, months, years from now with respect to their long-term cognition. Um, and speaking about sort of the brain fog after COVID, um, we know that critical illness in general, so people that are admitted to the ICU or people who are critically unwell, um, there's a condition um, that can occur post ICU, whereby, you know, the cognition is not what it was pre critical illness. And there's a lot of theories as to why that is, you know, a lot of it comes down to the critical illness itself leads to sort of an inflammatory storm that can affect cognition and can permanently affect cognitive function. So we know that we know that critical illness can contribute to um, cognitive impairment. So as far as COVID-19 and a link to dementia, I think time will tell kind of if we can um, tease that out. But I would say that certainly um, we know that delirium leads to dementia. So if COVID leads to delirium, it's possible that we may see people with um, cognitive consequences from COVID. Um, but I guess time will tell as we learn more about this very new virus. Well, I'm gonna ask you one last question here before we wrap things up. I yep. would hope you will say yes, that you will come back and share your expertise with, uh, with us again. Uh, Yes or no? I, I, I'd be honored. Thank okay, you. Okay, perfect. That's the best <laughs> question of the night. Anyway, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your um, lovely presentation uh, in all aspects around dementia, understanding dementia. And thank you to all the people that have been with us tonight and all their fabulous questions. We were able to spend just about as much time on the questions as the presentations and you know, the, the variety of questions we had was were just fabulous. So thank you.